let's get started. Thank you, uh, thank you for coming. Um, hope you're having a great KubeCon. I'm Daniel Lipovetsky. Uh, find me at dlipovetsky on Kubernetes Slack and uh, GitHub. I've been building software that creates and manages Kubernetes clusters for more than a few years now. Uh, I build it upstream in the Cluster API project and as an engineer at uh, day two IQ. I work a lot with Cluster API. And Cluster API is a complex Kubernetes application. So today, we're going to learn what it takes to debug it and other Kubernetes applications. Now, Kubernetes application and debug are not exact terms. When I say Kubernetes application, I mean an application that runs in one or more pods. When I say debug, I mean set breakpoints in code and step through them. It's also called interactive debugging. So first, let's quickly look at some technical details. Then I'll demonstrate a debug session. Then we'll look at the challenges that I faced and the solutions that I found. Then what work remains. And finally, I've got a call to action for all of you in here. If you've got slides uh, that you've downloaded, I uploaded a newer version. Uh, so you're welcome to, to download the latest one from the, from the site. So this presentation came out of my own attempt to step through code running in multiple pods. If you've been working in Kubernetes for a few years, you may be wondering, why didn't I just use Squash, which is an open source tool built to debug Kubernetes applications? That's a good question. Two reasons. One, it was designed before ephemeral containers were available. Two, it didn't solve some of the challenges I faced. That said, Squash was a source of knowledge and inspiration. You may also be wondering why I didn't use telepresence. That's a CNCF project that lets you run an application locally and makes it appear as though it runs in a cluster. In my experience, that works well if you're developing locally and running in one pod. But I want to debug an application that runs in multiple pods and is already deployed on a cluster. All right, let's take a closer look at Two things, cluster API, the application I want to debug, and ephemeral containers, the Kubernetes feature that helped me. Raise your hand if you know cluster API, if you know what it is. OK, some of you. That's good, good, OK. Uh, so cluster API manages Kubernetes clusters. And it's also a Kubernetes application. I've been working with it since its start in 2018. And two words describe it, complex and powerful. It's composed of more than 14 controllers running in more than four pods. While debugging cluster API, I faced most of the challenges you can expect to face debugging any Kubernetes application. This diagram shows the relationships between some of, the, uh, some of Cluster API's custom resources. Don't worry about the small font. The details aren't important. What's important is that the relationships are there. They mean that multiple Cluster API controllers work together. For example, if you want to add a machine to a cluster. So I wanted to follow along as these controllers did their work. And to do that, I needed to set breakpoints in multiple pods. Then I heard about ephemeral containers. So I needed to set breakpoints in pods. To do that, I needed to run the debugger in the pod. And I needed to give the debugger some special privileges. And to be honest, I had already done that a couple of years ago. But back then, I had to build, publish, deploy my own cluster API images, just include the debugger. It felt like a lot of work, and I didn't recommend it to others. Ephemeral containers let me do what I need with just a little work, and that makes it easier for you to reproduce what I've done. I don't have time to cover ephemeral containers in depth today, but I strongly recommend watching the Seeing is Believing talk. All right, 
let's see what we can achieve. Raise your hand if you've heard of uh, the demo gods. Okay, good, good, okay. So the people who have heard of the demo gods will understand why this demo is recorded. So let me, uh, let me, let me perform some magic and, uh, and switch to the video. And okay. So this is a VS Code session. And I'm going to debug processes in three pods. And the breakpoints that I've set are going to help us follow along as Cluster API creates a new machine. And you can reproduce this demo yourself. Uh, there is a link in the slides. And, and I hope you do reproduce it yourself. So let's start it. In the lower left-hand corner, I've set breakpoints uh, in three different controllers. And I'm attaching the debugger client to three different pods. So now I'm going to scale the number of worker machines in this cluster up by one, and Cluster API will go to work to create a new machine. First, we're going to get stopped at a breakpoint in a controller that creates some data that is used to run on the machine at first boot. And then I continue. And then we stop at another breakpoint in another controller in a second pod. And this one is actually what creates the machine itself. In this case, it's a Docker container. And then I continue. And it takes a little bit for the machine to get created. But then we end up at a third breakpoint in a third controller third pod, and this one is responsible for um, reconciling some, some metadata associating the new node when the machine joined the cluster, there's a new node resource, and we want to make sure that it's associated with the cluster API machine resource. So, let's see, aha, all right, so I hope that you thought that was cool. Like that, that is what's possible. Um, and if I can only find my mice, mouse pointer. Um, so to make all this work, I had to solve a few challenges. So let's go through them. Some of the examples you'll see are related to Cluster API and its Go implementation. But the challenges apply to any Kubernetes application, especially compiled ones. So this is the starting point, okay? We've got our debug client, local machine, source code, and then we've got a node and a pod and then our target container, okay? First challenge, there's no debugger in the pod. The debugger needs to run in the same process namespace as its target. I could just run it in the container if it had the debugger executable, maybe a shell, some other utilities, but it doesn't, that's good. You don't want those in the container image. They're not application dependencies, so they waste space most of the time. If they have any CVEs, you're going to get false positives on a CVE scan. I think you know the drill. So what can we do? We can build an image with the debugger executable, a shell, whatever we need. We can create an ephemeral container in the pod and use everything in our image. Here's the debugger image I used. It's got the Delve debugger for the Go language. It's based on an Alpine Linux image, so it has lots of utilities, including a shell. And I've included some other utilities for working with executables and debug information. After I built my debugger image, I created an ephemeral container in my pod. I gave it the name debugger, so I could refer to that when I ran kubectl exec, for example. The ephemeral container shares the process namespace of my target container. Ordinary containers cannot share a process namespace. On the other hand, ephemeral containers cannot be restarted or replaced. So once the last process in the container stops, you need to create a new ephemeral container with a new name. That can be inconvenient. For that reason, I used sleep to keep the container running and then used kubectl exec to run more processes in it. 
So this is what the environment looks like now, right? We've got an ephemeral container with our debugger. All right, are we done? Well, not quite. Once I had my ephemeral container, I ran my debugger and it wouldn't attach. After reading the documentation, looking at the pod events, I realized the debugger container had inherited the pod's restrictive security context. The debugger needs the ptrace capability and to run as root or with the user ID of the target process. The solution seemed straightforward. First, I defined a security context for my debugger container, giving it the sysptrace capability. Second, I allowed the debugger to run as root. I could have also run the debugger with the user ID of the target process, but I didn't want to take the extra step of matching the user ID, which I don't know ahead of time necessarily, and it was more convenient to use the root user with the Alpine Linux image. So on at least one node where I did this, the error didn't go away. And I discovered that the Yama kernel module that was running on that node was denying the debugger's ptray system call. So because I had privileged access to that node, I could reconfigure the module. Just something to watch out for. And finally, today it isn't that easy to set the security context on your ephemeral container. It's not yet supported by the kubectl debug CLI command. You have to send an HTTP request to the API server or patch the, the kubectl CLI to do it in a slightly different way. But it will be easier in the future. All right, so this is where we are now. We've got a debugger in our pod. We're attaching to the container, to, to the target process. Even after you give the debugger the right capability and user ID, it may fail to attach. If you see this error, it means the executable does not have debug info, which the debugger needs to understand the structure of a compiled program. So interpreted languages are not affected. Fortunately for me, Cluster API publishes executables with their debug info. Thank you. Other projects remove it. For example, debug info is not in the Kubernetes API server, controller manager, and scheduler executables. If your target executable does not have debug info, you may be able to provide it yourself. Sometimes that debug info is published separately. If it is, use that. If it's not, create it. The debug info must match the executable in the pod, so you'll have to build your own executable from the same source code revision using the same compiler and linker used to build the executable in the pod then you can extract the debug info to its own file. And that's what I've done here with this, uh, with this command line utility. After you've got that debug info, you can copy it into the container so that the debugger can read it. And finally, you'll need to add a special link to help the debugger find this debug info. Now, you may be wondering, Containers in a pod don't share a mountain namespace and don't see one another's root file systems. How is he able to write to the executable in another container? And that's thanks to the proc pseudo file system. The proc slash pid slash root path provides the same view of the file system that the process with that pid has. So here, process one is the example process. The debugger container has the sysptrace capability, which allows it access to this special path. So I've only tested this with Go executables, but the principles are the same for other compiled languages. So this is what our environment looks like now. Okay, we've got that debug info there. All right, once the debugger found the debug info, it attached to the process but now I was debugging in a terminal and I want to debug in VS Code. It's called remote debugging and it usually works with a client connected to a server using TCP or UDP 
the pod didn't expose ports I could use for this connection. And ephemeral containers can't expose ports. I had a few options, but the best by far was the port forward API, which allows you to forward TCP from your machine to any port in a pod. And it works by encapsulating TCP packets in speedy streams, goes via the Kubernetes API server and the kubelet on that pod. So this is what the environment looks like now. I've got a tunnel to my debug container. All right, I finally had remote debugging working. I was excited. I started to set breakpoints, and none of them worked. The breakpoints identified lines in source code stored at paths on my machine. The executable was built on a different machine, which used different paths, and so its debug info had those paths. And the debugger had no idea what to do with my source code paths. I could provide the debugger with a map to help it match my breakpoint locations with the debug info. I had no idea what the right map looked like because I didn't know the paths in the debug info. So I looked them up. The readalf utility can list the source paths in the debug info. I read through the paths and found a pattern that I was fairly confident in. And based on that pattern, I made a map and I gave it to the debugger. So for example, on, on my machine, if I had something in my home directory, example project, example go, in the debug info, that actually would be stored under a path of the module and its version and then the source file. So finally, let's recap, okay? One, we created the debugger container. Two, gave it the sysptrace capability. Three, created and uploaded the debug info if we needed to. Four, created a tunnel for the debugger client to reach the server. And five, showed the debugger how to translate the local source code paths to the paths in the debug info. So at this point, I was happily setting breakpoints in cluster API. When I noticed my debug sessions would mysteriously stop. And looking at the pod events, I found Kublet was stopping the target containers because they weren't responding to liveness probes while I was at a breakpoint. When I removed the liveness probes, I noticed that the debug sessions would still stop. But now, just after I resumed execution, after stopping at a breakpoint. So I looked at the pod logs and found that the controllers were losing leader election while I was at a breakpoint and were terminating them themselves when they resumed execution. Finally, cluster API controllers make Kubernetes API requests. And I noticed those requests often fail as I step through the code. I found that the requests were being sent to admission webhooks. These webhooks ran in the same process as the controller, and they weren't responding while I was at a breakpoint. Worse, the readiness probes eventually failed, and the requests were not even reaching the webhooks. So these challenges may or may not apply to your Kubernetes application, but I wanted to mention them all the same. In my case, I disabled leader election, removed the liveness and readiness probes, and to do that, I did have to make a small change to the cluster API deployment. And I could have avoided that by using log points, but I really wanted to step through the code. So there's still work left to do. First, to add support to profiles to kubectl debug so that users can get defaults for a security context that will work for a attaching a debugger to a process, for example. And I think there's also work left to be done 
to make it easier to get the debug info of a containerized application. In the Linux distro system package space, there is something called debug info D, but I'm not sure that that solution fits uh, well for containerized applications. Maybe there's something simple we could do, like deciding on a convention where we have an image with the suffix dash debug, TBD. So finally, a call to action for all of you in here. Set breakpoints in your Kubernetes applications. Learn to do it and feel confident in, in being able to do it and teach others. If you've got any questions, if you want to collaborate on this topic, reach out to me, Dila Pavetsky, on Kubernetes Slack. I'll be at the Day 2 IQ booth tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, I just want to say you know, thank you all for coming. Thank you to my, uh, to my wife and son, my Day 2 IQ colleagues, and a lot of people uh, that maintain uh, the software that I use to, um, yeah, to, to get this work done. So. If you have any questions, and there's time left for questions, fortunately, uh, there are mics at the, uh, on both sides. Um, but yeah, otherwise, and if you've got any feedback, uh, scan, the, scan the QR code. And thanks again. <laughs>